or having a child. I, d I didn't know much about anything like that. How about you? Okay, being the mother, <laughs> <laughs> I was quite excited. I knew somewhat about babies and knew that they were lovable and pray they'd be healthy and want to be a good mother. A lot of joy. We lived in apartments. Um, I had never ever lived in an apartment, so that was pretty new to me. I didn't like apartment living too well, but I, um, you know, got along okay. And we were only there like um, maybe a year, I think. We bought a house nearby. In Deer Park. In Deer Park. Uh -huh. Do you remember how much you paid for that first house? I think fourteen thousand, probably fourteen five, something like that. It was five rooms. Uh huh. Six rooms. It's a nice house. Uh -huh. Big yard. I always want a nice big yard from our kids. Uh -huh. I guess because I was raised in a wild open space, so I want that for them. <laughs> for a fourteen thousand dollar house, mortgage payments are not weren't uh -huh. too big. But again, we weren't making too much money. So we we had a our financial situation was uh pretty good. It wasn't it wasn't great, but it was good. It was enough for us. Um we lived there for 3 years. 5. It was 5. Was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then we moved to Texas. <laughs> well, I, I I got a government scholarship, <clears throat> all expenses paid, and a stipend per month for the year that we were there. That I worked on a master's degree, and. We lived in a house. We we moved to Austin. Uh, we had a a trailer that we pulled that we put all of our belongings in, and moved to Austin, Texas. First, we went to Louisiana. I got a scholarship there at University of Southwestern Louisiana for the summer. Then we went from there to Austin, and we were there for a full year. We didn't have a, a place to move into, and we went out the second day we were there. We stayed in a motel. We went out the second day looking for a place to move into. We saw a man working in the yard of a house, and we stopped and talked to him and said, Do you know of any places... Um, around that we could rent for the school year and he said this house right here is available and so we rented it and we rented it for $75 a month we rented one of our bedrooms and the bathroom to him for $45 a month and we were paying 75 so we only ended up paying $30 a month I had to write a thesis, and it took me two years to get that done. And what was your thesis on? It was a mathematics book, a teaching, um, self-teaching book. Uh, well, while we at Austin, I'll say this. Um, we didn't have any la uh, laundry facilities in our house, so I'd take the kids and go to the laundromat, so I'd throw that in. So we left there. <laughs> well, then there's uh, a guy that lay f was on the program with Lay from uh, San Mateo, California, and he kept saying, you need to go to California. They pay teachers really a lot of money, so Leif applied, and he got up and went to California for a year. We only stayed a year. Why? At that time, we didn't like it that well, <laughs> it seemed like. I get maybe we missed home, but it seemed like the kids were sick a lot there, like it was cool at nights, and we just wanted to go home, so we did. Back to Reading. Back to Reading, Ohio. And where did you, did you teach in Reading High School? Mm -hmm. One year. One more year. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And then where did you move from there? Uh, we just rented a place there, and then we moved. We bought another house over in Deer Park, where we had been sort of before. 
and we bought a house there. It was one that needed to be fixed up. We worked on it and fixed it up and painted it and got it all pretty. And we lived there five years. Your so park was a nice little town where your kids could go to the park and play. And um, what else? Some of the things they did. They was in, bed was in scouts, and I guess Rob played t-ball back then, and all the things that go on in a town that little kids can be involved in, and same with us. And then we were involved in our church, and our friends were there, and had children. What was the name of the church? Uh, Mount Carmel Baptist Church. We still go to church there today. <laughs> well, I had a boys' <clears throat> group called Royal Ambassadors. This was for young men, mission study, um, and we had a great group of boys that um, we worked with. And she taught Sunday school, and she had she was had. GAs, I had RAs, and she yeah, girls, worked with yeah. GAs, and those were girls in action. It was also a mission group. So our kids grew up in church the way we wanted them to. Um, they, I would say, were good students in, in school. Um, I think that was one of our main goals for our family was church orientation and getting a good education. Beverly, I like that name. I, I don't know about other people. When you have children, you toss a lot of names around and come up with one. And that name hadn't been overused, so I chose Beverly. And Leif agreed on it. And then Rob came. Um, he was named for my brother, Bob. And then his name's Robert Dan. We just put the Dale in and called him Rob. And then the youngest one, Charlene, is her name. She, she was really named for my dad. His name was Charlie, and it was supposed to be Charlene, but that never got off the ground. She was called Charlene, and then people started calling her Char. We did, and then other people. She goes by Char. Her sister worked at a oil refinery in Kentucky, and I drove back and forth and worked there. Mm -hmm. When we were in college, I worked there in the summertime as a laborer, and after I started teaching, I continued to work there until the plant closed down, and then I, I did other jobs as a carpenter's helper and things like that. What was your job uh, all those years at the refinery? Oh, digging ditches and cleaning up oil spills, and really hard work. I think we did things like we went to, um, in Kentucky, they had, um, Barbersville had some kind of shows and things. We went down there, and we didn't take any big vacations. Um, when the kids were small, later on, Lace's parents was in Florida. We used to go to Florida pretty often see them and do things down there. We really we really didn't have the money to do much vacationing. <laughs> Leif was the more harsh one than I was. Uh, I would give a little spank once in a while. Of course, I'd be put in jail for that now, I guess. But <laughs> just a little swat didn't hurt him. And uh, I don't think Leif ever, you never spanked him very much, did you? You didn't have to. You were sort of stern with him. And, so. I used my school teacher yeah, look. Thank you. <laughs> Can you give us that look on camera? <laughs> Let's see that well, look. This isn't it. <laughs> I was a very stern teacher. Were you? Mm -hmm. How about a coach? Mm -hmm. No nonsense. Yep. Okay. Straight. Mr. Stern here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, it, <clears throat> it, it wasn't bad because um, some teachers were so loosey-goosey that they couldn't teach, and some were a lot harder than I was. Um, I, I had discipline, and I enforced it by just talking. Never touched a child or did anything like that. Raise your voice? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very quietly. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got two voices. <laughs> seemed like we moved every five years. Oh, but every time more we, often than that. Every time we moved, it was an upgrade, seemed like. And then we moved in this really nice uh, school district where Leif taught there. And then um, that's where our kids went to school, and all three of them graduated. And uh, I guess all three of them went to, had math on their Leif. And got along real no, good Bev with him. Didn't. Mm-hmm. Bev didn't. Oh yeah, she had that. <laughs> she had this man that went to sleep in class. Real and, close friend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> and she was an honor student, and she could have either had him or me. And the school decided that it wouldn't be good for a one of my children to go to me, so they put her in his class. And he had heart problems, on a lot of medication. And he slept in class a lot, and she lost total interest in in being a good math student. She was she was a top math student, and she would have got a great basic background if she had been in my class. Rob was in my class for two years. He didn't flunk one year and then have to come back. <laughs> Two different classes, and Shar was in my class for one year. Rob was freshman and sophomore, and Shar was a sophomore, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Indian Hill High School, very exclusive area. But we lived on. We didn't live there. We lived on the edge. We lived on within the boundaries. It's funny how boundaries go way out sometimes. We lived in the boundaries. Yeah. But our kids got along good with the kids that had money. There was, I remember when I went, when the kids first started going there, and I went to see the counselor, and he said, you know, your kids will find their niche. Don't worry about it. And they did. They had some friends that was pretty rich, and some friends was just as average as they were. Mm-hmm. So it worked out okay. All three of them <laughs> are Christians. <laughs> they all three... Um, Continued with their walk with Jesus and still do today. Um, our oldest got, got married and the two of them became missionaries. They were missionaries in Israel for 25 years. Um, and our other two have been active in the churches that they go to and are active today. And I remember one thing that the oldest one said when she was about nine years old. It was in the 60s, when early 60s, because she was born in 51. She was probably nine. When there was riots going on, you know, and people were carrying on. And um, we'd gone to the church, and uh, there was rumor that... Uh, people were coming out from downtown, and they was on a riot, and they was going to tear up where we lived, and uh, which wasn't true at all. It was just a rumor. But she and I was going home, and she said, um, but I thought that God created everybody equal. And I said, well, he did, but men don't see people as being equal. And that really, really st- always stuck out with me that she put it that way. Mm-hmm. They were really good kids growing up. Uh, not saying that they never did anything wrong. I wouldn't say that. But they always seemed like they had a lot of respect for us and loved us. And, of course, we loved them and still do. And um, they brought a lot of joy to us and still do. So, your turn. Well, you know, it's really funny. It's hard for (laughs) me to express my love to them or to Jean, verbally. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's ways that you can express your love um, besides just saying, I love you. Um, And I don't think we say that to them as often as we should. Um, I don't know. I just, I find it hard to say that. But I, I mean it. And it's it's strong, but as far as just saying it, I don't say it very often. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like we love you, and that that says it. But 
doesn't say it maybe the way it ought to be said. I, I don't know. <laughs> but you mean it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, what advice would you give to people uh, who are raising children today on parenting? Well, I guess my advice would be is um, say what you mean and mean what you say when it comes to discipline. Um, try to be home with them as much as you can. And which I wasn't. Well, we got <laughs> they turned out okay. Um, but, In spite of me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I think family life is important. Discipline is important. You don't have to smack them around or anything like that, but you need to let them know there are rules and boundaries, and you have rules in your house. And sometimes I think I wasn't. I really was a good mother, I guess, but then you think back. You know there's things that maybe you should have done differently. I'm, I don't know. I think all mothers probably think that. Sure. And fathers, too. Fathers. <laughs> How long have you? Go ahead. I think the important <coughs> thing is to raise your family in a church. And I think it's important for you to be in that church and take an active part in the church. Not bring your kids to church and drop them off and pick them up after church. Um, if you train a child in the way he should go when he grows up, uh, he'll remember that. And I think that's true in, in the way we try to be a model for our grandchildren and will be for our great-grandchildren. Um, you know, you can be the model, and they can either follow it or not follow it. But if you're not the model, then the chances of them following the right direction is a little less than if, if you're there and you're modeling something. How would you like to be remembered to your future generations? Well, the world's a big place. <laughs> life can be long or short, and so forth. We've been given a pretty long life, which I'm thankful for. Um, just do what is right and the best you can, and when the chips are down, we just don't give up and be positive and... There you go. We've mm -hmm. gone through highs and lows <clears throat> and continue to do it. Um, you try and make the highs not too high and the lows not too low. Um, be a good example. Try to do what's right as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Faith is an important part in our lives. Um, I think that I... I became a Christian when I was like 13 or 14. Uh, I'm sure I didn't walk the straight and narrow way. I still don't. So. <laughs> um, but uh, your faith, you can depend on your faith, which comes from God, to give you what you need every day, not just when things aren't so good. Um, I think you can extend your your faith not your, Christ, your complete Christianity to your children, but your faith. They can see the faith that you have. Um, it just binds you to your friends. And the main thing, you have to be prepared for death. And the Bible says you don't live until you die. And that means, like, you know, you come to him. And um, I guess you just sort of hope that when it's your turn, you don't have to go through a whole lot before you die. But... Um, I just, I just know I'm, I'm ready. So, I know where I'll be, and that's the main thing you have to know. And, and you know, it's not that you feel afraid of death. I think the unknown is what frightens anybody or everybody. Even though the Bible lays out like heaven's exactly what it's going to be like, but then separation from your family is a big thing. They, I've always heard. Well, I, I think that's the biggest thing. You know, you, 
you look at your kids, you see them grow up, you hope that they turn out the way they should. And then when they turn out, they have grand then they have children, and you look at them and you think, I wonder how much of their life we're gonna share. Mm -hmm. And then when you have great grandchildren, you think, Well, you know, we're not gonna be around when they're in high school. Um and and those kind of things sort of bother me. Um, I don't want a painful death. I'd, I'd like for it to be boom. <laughs> and I think most people would. <laughs> this is um, one I like. It probably would not be my very favorite. I don't know. But it's Jeremiah 21, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. And there actually is a message in that for all of us right there. Well, you know, it's it's taken a long time to mature into the kind of Christian that I am. I have a long way to go yet. And as I tell other people, you need to keep on keeping on till the last of your life. It's a, it's a journey that never ends, and it, it doesn't have an ending because you get to be 80 years old. Or you still need to be a good witness to other people um, because people look at you every day. They say, now, how's... How's he handling it this late in life? Is he turning away from God or is he um, not being the kind of person that he should be? Um, and, you know, sometimes when people get older, they do um, drift and don't keep on doing what they should be doing. And, I I just pray that when the end comes that um, I can persevere right to the end. And I know Gene will do the same thing. But, you know, it's taken a long time to get where we are. Um, and we've still got a long way to go. How do you expect to retire? <clears throat> okay, you retired in 84, didn't you? Mm-hmm. I think you worked a little bit doing I don't know what, but then um, there was a. <laughs> um, we knew a lot of the missionaries in Israel because our daughter number was on the field there working. And they called one day and wanted to know um, well, first of all, there was um, the children had to go into Tel Aviv area uh, to go to school. And they, the Baptists had built a, a dormitory for them. And now, way back, there was a lot of children did that, but they had lots of children way back. But then it could be like four kids or six children or eight. And they called, and they had four at the time, and wanted to know if we could come, if I could be the cook for them. And uh, there was only four, and do it for six months while the other dorm parents came back to States on furlough. And... Um, at first, I said, oh, my goodness, I couldn't do that. I couldn't cook for those kids. But then I said, oh, yeah. So we went, and it was such a joy. In fact, we ended up going back another time for a whole year at the dorm, and then another time Leif went back and did some painting in different houses for the missionaries. So that was um, probably 80, around 86. Six. Yeah, 86, and then 87, maybe 88. We came home in 89 then. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It was really a joy. We're always busy. You know, mm -hmm. after we quit going to Israel, <clears throat> uh, our church ground is like seven acres. And they bought two more pieces of property, which gave them about 10 acres. 
And for five years, I managed, um, managed is not the right word, I cut all the grass and trimmed all the bushes and um, as a volunteer. And they now have six people that do that um, rotating and they do the same work that I did. How long have you been married, Jean? Uh, 49. be 59 years in June. June? Mm -hmm. June the 25th. Mm -hmm. And how would you describe your marriage? Uh, good, rocky, good. <laughs> <laughs> along the way, ups and downs, but you hang in there, you'll come out okay. <laughs> <laughs> and from what I understand, you've got a story about your wedding ring. <laughs> <laughs> Would you share that with us? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, is, this is my wedding ring, and um, it's been on this finger um, for 59 years. Never have taken it off. Um, probably as dirty as anything. Um, I know it's thin. My finger has a, a big dent in it from where it's been because I've got so fat. Um, but I'd like to get another wedding ring and put slip this off onto a chain and then put it around my neck. <laughs> Did you know that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you I heard it here. You heard it here first. Huh? I thought I'd give a new wedding ring, but not put that around its neck. <laughs> <laughs> well, that way it'll be on there from the time we're married till we're separated. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. How would you describe your your marriage? Uh, tough. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was. When we got married, I was 18. I was very immature. Um, our marriage would not have lasted as long as it has lasted, except for Jean. Um, she, <clears throat> she's the rock of the family, and I know that. Um, it's taken me a long, long road to mature to where I am, and hasn't been easy. Uh, there's been a lot of ups and downs, and um, I, attribute, I attribute most of the downs to me being immature and her her hanging in there. If you could turn to her and, and look at her right now, what would you say to her? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, whoa, <laughs> it's been a hard 59 years, hasn't it? <laughs> but I still love you. <laughs> well, how would you respond to that? <laughs> well, I think you know what your biggest addiction was. It was baseball, basketball, wasn't it? It still is. Yeah, I know. I morning, just went in there a few minutes ago and looked to see what the score was. And the morning paper, but that's okay. <laughs> but anyhow, you've been worth hanging in there with, and I love you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I have a lot of things I could add, but I'm not going to. Oh, boy, that was no, fun.